Section 34 of Poems of American History, the Colonial Era. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ed Humple. Poems of American History, the Colonial Era. Chapter 8, The Struggle for the Continent, Part 3. Though the Peace of Utrecht, 1714, closed the war, desultory raids continued. In April, 1725, John Lovewell, of Dunstable, with 46 men, marched against the Indian town of Pigwacket, or Pequaquet, now Freiburg. On the morning of May 8th, they were suddenly attacked by a large force of Indians who had formed an ambuscade. Twelve men fell at the first fire, among them Lovewell himself. The survivors fought against heavy odds until sunset, when the Indians drew off without having been able to scalp the dead. It was this battle, in its day as famous in New England as was Chevy Chase at the Scottish border, which inspired the earliest military ballad still extant, composed in America. Its author is unknown, but it was for many years the best beloved song in all New England. Love Wells Fight May 8, 1725 of worthy Captain Lovewell I propose now to sing, how valiantly he served his country and his king. He and his valiant soldiers did range the woods full wide, and hardships they endured to quell the Indians' pride. T'was nigh unto Pigwacket on the eighth day of May, they spied a rebel Indian soon after break of day. He on bank was walking upon a neck of land, which leads into a pond as we've made to understand. Our men resolved to have him, and travelled two miles round till they met the Indian who boldly stood his ground. Then spake up Captain Lovewell, Take you good heed, says he. This rogue is too decoyous, I very plainly see. The Indians lie in ambush, in some place nigh at hand, in order to surround us upon this neck of land. Therefore we'll march in order, and each man leave his pack, that we may briskly fight them when they make their attack. Then came unto this Indian, who did them thus defy? As soon as they came nigh him, two guns he did let fly, which wounded Captain Lovewell, and likewise one man more. But when this rogue was running, they laid him in his gore. Then having scalped the Indian, they went back to the spot where they had laid their packs down, but there they found them not. For the Indians, having spied them, when they them down did lay, did seize them for their plunder and carry them away. These rebels lay in ambush, this very place hard by, so that an English soldier did one of them a spy, and cried out, Here's an Indian, and with that they started out, as fiercely as old lions, and hideously did shout. With that our valiant English all gave a loud huzzah, to show the rebel Indians they feared not them a straw. So now the fight began, and as fiercely as could be, the Indians ran up to them, but soon were forced to flee. Then spake up Captain Lovewell, when first the fight began. Fight on, my valiant heroes, you see they fall like rain. For as we are informed, the Indians were so thick, a man could scarcely fire a gun, and not some of them hit. And did the rebels try their best our soldiers to surround? But they could not accomplish it, because there was a pond, to which our men retreated, and covered all the rear. The rogues were forced to face them, although they skulked for fear. Two logs there were behind them that close together lay. Without being discovered, they could not get away. Therefore our English, they traveled in a row, and at a handsome distance, as they were wont to go. T'was ten o'clock in the morning, when first the fight began, and fiercely did continue until the setting sun. Excepting that the Indians, some hours before t'was night, drew off into the bushes and ceased a while to fight. But soon again returned, in fierce and furious mood, shouting as in the morning, but yet not half so loud. For as we are informed, so thick and fast they fell, scarce twenty of their number at night did get home well. And that our valiant English till midnight there did stay, to see whether the rebels would have another fray. But they no more returning, they made off towards their home, and brought away their wounded as far as they could come. Of all our valiant English there were but thirty-four and of the rebel Indians there were about fourscore, and sixteen of our English did safely home return. The rest were killed and wounded, for which we all must mourn. Our worthy Captain Lovewell, among them there did die. They killed Lieutenant Robbins, and wounded good young Fry. Who was our English chaplain? 
He many Indians slew, and some of them he scalped when bullets round him flew. Young Fulham, too, I'll mention, because he fought so well. Endeavoring to save a man, a sacrifice he fell. But yet our valiant Englishmen in fight were ne'er dismayed. But still they kept their motion, and Wyman's captain made, who shot the old chief Pogus, which did the foe defeat, and set his men in order, and brought off the retreat. And braving many dangers and hardships on the way, they safe arrived at Dunstable, the thirteenth day of May. The story of Lovewell's fight is told in another ballad, printed in Farmer and Moore's Historical Collections, in 1824. It is an excellent example of ballad literature, describing the struggle in great detail and with unusual accuracy. Lovewell's Fight, May 8, 1725 What time the noble Lovewell came, with fifty men from Dunstable, the cruel Pequot tribe detained, with arms and bloodshed terrible. Then did the crimson streams that flowed seem like the waters of the brook, that brightly shine, that loudly dash, down the cliffs of Agiochuk. With love well brave, John Harwood came. From wife and babes was hard to part. Young Harwood took her by the hand, and bound the weeper to his heart. Repress that tear, my merry dear, said Harwood to his loving wife. It tries me hard to leave thee here, and seek in distant woods the strife. When gone, my Mary, think of me, and pray to God that I may be such as one ought that lives for thee, and come at last in victory. Thus left young Harwood babe and wife, with accent wild she bade adieu. It grieved those lovers much to part, so fond and fair, so kind and true. Seth Wyman, who in Woburn lived, a marksman he of courage true, shot the first Indian whom they saw, sheer through his heart the bullet flew. The savage had been seeking game, two guns and eke a knife he bore, and two black ducks were in his hand. He shrieked and fell to rise no more. Anon there eighty Indians rose, who hid themselves in ambush dread. Their knives they shook, their guns they aimed, the famous Pogus at their head. Good heavens, they dance the powwow dance, what horrid yells the forest fill. The grim bear crouches in his den, the eagle seeks the distant hill. What means this dance, this powwow dance, stern Wyman said with wondrous art. He crept full near, his rifle aimed, and shot the leader through the heart. John Lovewell, captain of the band, his sword he waved that glittered bright. For the last time he cheered his men and led them onward to the fight. Fight on, fight on, brave Lovewell said, fight on while heaven shall give you breath. An Indian ball then pierced him through, and Lovewell closed his eyes in death. John Harwood died all bathed in blood, when he had fought till set of day, and many more we may not name, fell in that bloody battle fray. When news did come to Harwood's wife, that he with love well fought and died, far in the wilds had given his life, nor more would in their home abide. Such grief did seize upon her mind, such sorrow filled her faithful breast, on earth she ne'er found peace again, but followed Harwood to his rest. Twas Pogus led the Pequot tribe, as runs the fox would Pogus run, as howls the wild wolf would he howl, a large bear skin had Pogus on. But Chamberlain, of Dunstable, one whom a savage ne'er shall slay, met Pogus by the waterside and shot him dead upon that day. Good heavens, is it a time for prayer? Is this a time to worship God, when Lovewell's men are dying fast, and Pogus's tribe have felt the rod? The chaplain's name was Jonathan Fry. In Andover his father dwelt, and oft with Lovewell's men he prayed, before the mortal wound he felt. A man was he of comely form, polished and brave, well learnt and kind. Old Harvard's learned halls he left, far in the wilds a grave to find. Ah, now his blood-red arm he lifts, his closing lids he tries to raise, and speak once more before he dies, in supplication and in praise. He prays kind heaven to grant success, brave Lovewell's men to guide and bless, and when they've shed their heart-blood true, to raise them all to happiness. Come hither, farewell, said young Fry, to see that I am about to die. Now for the love I bear to you, when cold in death my bones shall lie. Go thou and see my parents dear, and tell them you stood by me here, 
console them when they cry, alas, and wipe away the falling tear. Lieutenant Farwell took his hand, his arm around his neck he threw, and said, Brave chaplain, I would wish that heaven had made me die for you. The chaplain on kind Farwell's breast, bloody and languishing he fell, nor after this said more but this, I love thee, soldier, fare thee well. Ah, many a wife shall rend her hair, and many a child cry, Woe is me, when messengers the news shall bear of Lovewell's dear-bought victory. With footsteps slow shall travellers go, where Lovewell's pond shines clear and bright, and mark the place where those are laid who fell in Lovewell's bloody fight. Old men shall shake their heads and say, Sad was the hour and terrible, when Lovewell brave gainst Pogus went, with fifty men from Dunstable. End of section 34Section 35 of Poems of American History, The Colonial Era. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ed Humple. Poems of American History, The Colonial Era. Chapter 8, The Struggle for the Continent. Part 4. The fight near Lovewell's Pond was the ground of still another case of literary priority. Nearly a hundred years after its occurrence, on November 17, 1820, the Portland Gazette printed the first poetical venture of a lad of thirteen years. It bore the title, The Battle of Lovell's Pond. Its author was Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. The Battle of Lovell's Pond, May 8, 1725. Cold, cold is the north wind and rude is the blast, that sweeps like a hurricane loudly and fast, as it moans through the tall waving pines lone and drear, sighs a requiem sad or the warrior's bier. The war whoop is still, and the savage's yell has sunk into silence along the wild dell. The din of the battle, the tumult is o'er, and the war clarion's voice is now heard no more. The warriors that fought for their country and bled have sunk to their rest, the damp earth is their bed. No stone tells the place where their ashes repose, nor points out the spot from the graves of their foes. They died in their glory, surrounded by fame, and victory's loud trump their death did proclaim. They are dead, but they live in each patriot's breast, and their names are engraven on honor's bright crest. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow the English gained a notable victory in the summer of 1745 when they captured the formidable fortress of Louisbourg, which had been built by the French on the eastern coast of Cape Breton Island. News of the victory created the greatest joy throughout the colonies. Louisbourg, June 17, 1745 Neptune and Mars in council sat to humble France's pride, whose vain unbridled insolence all other powers defied. The gods, having sat in deep debate upon the puzzling theme, broke up perplexed and both agreed, surely should form the scheme. Surely, with Britain's glory fired, heaven's favoring smile implored, let Louisburg return, he said, unto its ancient lord. At once the camp and fleet were filled with Britain's loyal sons, whose hearts are filled with generous strife to avenge their country's wrongs. With liberty their breasts are filled, fair liberty's their shield, Tis liberty their banner waves and hovers o'er the field. Lewis, behold the unequal strife thy slaves and walls immured, while George's sons laugh at those walls of victory assured. One key to your oppressive pride, your western Dunkirk's gone. So Pepperell and Warren bade, and what they bade was done. Forbear, proud prince, your gasconades, to Deum cease to sing. When Britons fight, the Grand Monarch must yield to Britain's king. Boston, December, 1745 Louis XV felt the loss of Louisbourg keenly, and in 1746, to avenge its fall, sent a strong fleet under Admiral de Anville against Boston. The town was terror-stricken, but after many mishaps the fleet was finally dispersed by a great storm off Cape Sable, on October 15, 1746, 
and such of the ships as lived through it were forced to make their way back to France. A Ballad of the French Fleet October 15, 1746 Mr. Thomas Prince, Loquitur A fleet with flags arrayed sailed from the port of Brest, and the admiral's ship displayed the signal steer southwest. For this Admiral de Anville had sworn by cross and crown to ravage with fire and steel our helpless Boston town. There were rumors in the street, in the houses there was fear, of the coming of the fleet and the danger hovering near. And while from mouth to mouth spread the tidings of dismay, I stood in the old south, saying humbly, Let us pray. O oh Lord, we would not advise, but if in thy providence a tempest should arise to drive the French fleet hence, and scatter it far and wide, or sink it in the sea, we should be satisfied and thine the glory be. This was the prayer I made, for my soul was all on flame, and even as I prayed, the answering tempest came. It came with a mighty power, shaking the windows and walls, and tolling the bell in the tower as it tolls at funerals. The lightning suddenly unsheathed its flaming sword, and I cried, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The heavens were black with cloud, the sea was white with hail, and ever more fierce and loud blew the October gale. The fleet it overtook, and the broad sails in the van, like the tents of Kushan shook, or the curtains of Midian. Down the reeling decks crashed the o'erwhelming seas, and never were there wrecks so pitiful as these. Like a potter's vessel broke the great ships of the line. They were carried away as a smoke, or sank like lead in the brine. O oh Lord, before thy path they vanished and ceased to be, when thou didst walk in wrath with thine horses through the sea. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow End of section 35section 36 of poems of american history the colonial era this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by ed humple poems of american history the colonial era chapter 8 the struggle for the continent part 5 Peace was made at Aix-la-Chapelle in 1748, but it was really only a truce. England and France could not be permanently at peace until one or the other was undisputed master of the North American continent. The French claimed all the country west of the Alleghenies and enforced their claims by building a string of forts, among them Fort Duquesne at the head of the Ohio. At last, in 1755, was the British lion roused. THE BRITISH LION ROUSED, 1755 Hail, great Apollo! Guide my feeble pen to rouse the august lion from his den, exciting vengeance on the worst of men. Rouse, British lion, from thy soft repose, and take revenge upon the worst of foes, who try to wring and haul you by the nose. They always did thy quiet breast annoy, raising rebellion with the rival boy, seeking thy faith and interest to destroy. Treaties and oaths they always did break through. They never did nor would keep faith with you, by popes and priests indulged so to do. All neighboring powers and neutral standers by look on our cause with an impartial eye and see their falseness and their perfidy. Their grand encroachments on us ne'er did cease, but by indulgence mightily increase killing and scalping us in time of peace. They buy our scalps exciting savage clans, in children's blood for to imbue their hands, assisted by their cruel Gallic bands. Britons, strike home, strike home decisive blows upon the heads of your perfidious foes, who always truth and justice did oppose. Go brave the ocean with your warlike ships, and speak your terror o'er the western deeps, and crush the squadrons, of the Gallic fleets. Cleave liquid mountains of the foaming flood, and tinge the billows with the Gallic blood by faithful drubbing to their future good. Bury their squadrons ill in watery tombs, and when the news under Versailles it comes, let Lewis swear by Gar and gnaw his thumbs. 
Oh, ride triumphant o'er the Gallic powers, and conquer all these cursed foes of ours, and sweep the ocean with your iron showers. While all the tribes in Neptune's spacious hall shall stand astonished at the cannonball, to see such hailstones down among them fall. Some of their tribes perhaps are killed dead, and others in vast amazement fled, while Neptune stands aghast and scratches his head. My roving muse the surface reach again, search every part of the Atlantic plain, and see if any Gallics yet remain. And if they do, let British cannon roar, and let thy thunders reach the western shore, while I strive to rouse her sons once more. Stephen Tilden Active hostilities began early in 1755. On February 20th, General Edward Braddock landed at Hampton, Virginia, and proceeded at once to organize an expedition to march against Fort Duquesne. George Washington, who had already had some bitter experience with the French, was made one of his aides de camp. On May 29th, the army, with an immense wagon train, began its long journey across the mountains. THE SONG OF BRADDOCK'S MEN MAY 29th, 1755 To arms, to arms, my jolly grenadiers, hark how the drums do roll it along. To horse, to horse, with valiant good cheer, we'll meet our proud foe before it is long. Let not your courage fail you, be valiant, stout, and bold, and it will soon avail you, my loyal hearts of gold. Huzzah, my valiant countrymen, again I say huzzah, tis nobly done, the day's our own, huzzah, huzzah. March on, march on, brave Braddock leads the foremost, the battle is begun as you may fairly see. Stand firm, be bold, and it will soon be over, we'll soon gain the field from our proud enemy. A squadron now appears, my boys, if that they do but stand. Boys, never fear, be sure you mind the word of command. Huzzah, my valiant countrymen, again I say huzzah, tis nobly done, the day's our own, huzzah, huzzah. See how, see how they break and fly before us, see how they are scattered all over the plain. Now, 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 now our country will adore us, in peace and in triumph, boys, when we return again. Then laurels shall our glory crown, for all our actions told. The hills shall echo all around, my loyal hearts of gold. Huzzah, my valiant countrymen, again I say huzzah. Tis nobly done, the day's our own. Huzzah, huzzah. Braddock, with a picked force of about twelve hundred men, reached the Monongahela July 8th in excellent order, and, on the following morning, with colors flying and drums beating, marched against the fort. The French garrison, under Contrecoeur, was in panic and ready for flight, but a young captain of regulars named Bougeot with difficulty obtained permission to take out a small party, mostly Indians, to harass the advancing column. They encountered the English about seven miles from the fort, marching in close order along a narrow road which the pioneers had made. The Indians opened fire, spreading along either flank, and protected by the underbrush. The English, crowded together in the open road, could not see their enemies and were thrown into confusion. Braddock, wild with rage, refused to permit them to fight in Indian fashion, but beat them back into line with his sword. At last a bullet struck him down, and his troops fled in panic from the field. Braddock's Fate With an Incitement to Revenge July ninth, 1755 Come, all ye sons of Brittany, assist my muse in tragedy, and mourn brave Braddock's destiny, and spend a mournful day upon Monongahela fields. The mightier fallen o'er their shields, and British blood bedews the hills of western Gilboa. July the ninth, O oh, fatal day, they had a bold and bloody fray. Our host was smote with a dismay, some basely did retire and left brave Braddock in the field, who had much rather die than yield, a while his sword he bravely wheeled in clouds of smoke and fire. Some time he bravely stood his ground, a thousand foes did him surround, till he received a mortal wound which forced him to retreat. He died upon the thirteenth day, as he was homeward on his way. Alas, alas, we all must say, 
a sore and sad defeat. Now to his grave this hero's born, while savage foes triumph and scorn, and drooping banners dress his urn and guard him to his tomb. Heralds and monarchs of the dead, you that so many worms have fed, he's coming to your chilly bed, edge close and give him room. His Epitaph Beneath this stone brave Braddock lies, who always hated cowardice, but fell a savage sacrifice amidst his Indian foes. I charge you, heroes of the ground, to guard this dark pavilion round, to keep off all obtruding sound, and cherish his repose. Sleep, sleep, I say, brave valiant man, bold death at last has bid thee stand, and to resign thy great command, and cancel thy commission. Although thou didst not much incline thy post and honors to resign, now iron slumber doth confine, none envies thy condition. A SURVEY OF THE FIELD OF BATTLE Return, my muse, unto the field, see what a prospect it doth yield. Ingrateful to the eyes and smell a carnage bathed in gore, lies scalped and mangled o'er the hills, while sanguine rivers fill the dales, and pale-faced horror spreads the fields, the like ne'er here before. And must these sons of Brittany be clouded, set in western skies, and fall a savage sacrifice? Oh, tis a gloomy hour. My blood boils high in every vein, to climb the mountains of the slain, and break the iron jaws in twain of savage Gallic power. Our children with their mothers die, while they aloud for mercy cry. They kill and scalp them instantly, then fly into the woods and make a mock of all their cries, and bring their scalps a sacrifice to their infernal deities, and praise their demon gods. Revenge! Revenge the harmless blood which their inhuman dogs have shed in every frontier neighborhood. For near these hundred years their murdering clan in ambush lies to kill and scalp them by surprise, and free from tender parents' eyes ten hundred thousand tears. Their skulking, scalping, murdering tricks have so enraged old sixty-six with arms and legs like withered sticks and youthful vigor gone, that if he lives another year, complete in armor he'll appear and laugh at death and scoff at fear to right his country's wrong. Let young and old, both high and low, arm well against this savage foe, who all around environ us so, the sons of black delusion. New England's sons, you know their way, and how to cross them in their play, and drive these murdering dogs away unto their last confusion. One bold effort, oh, let us make, at one blow behead the snake, and then these savage powers will break, which long have us oppressed. And this, brave soldiers, will we do, if heaven and George shall say so too, and if we drive the matter through, the land will be at rest. Come every soldier, charge your gun, and let your task be killing one. Take aim until the work is done, don't throw away your fire. For he that fires without an aim may kill his friend and be to blame, and in the end come off with shame when forced to retire. O motherland, we think we're sure, sufficient is thy marine powers to dissipate all eastern showers, and if our arms be blessed, thy sons in North America will drive these hell-born dogs away as far beyond the realms of day as east is from the west. Forbear, my muse, thy barbarous song, upon this theme thou dwellst too long. It is too high and much too strong, the learned won't allow. Much honor should accrue to him who ne'er was at their academ. Come blot out every telesem, Get home unto thy plough. Stephen Tilden Composed August 20th, 1755 Ned Braddock July 9th, 1755 Said the sword to the axe, Twixt the wax and the hacks, Who's your bold berserker cleaving of tracks, Hewing a highway through greenwood and glen, Foot free for cattle and heart free for men? Braddock of Fontenoy, stubborn and grim, carving a cross on the wilderness rim, in his own doom building large for the Lord, steeple and state, said the axe to the sword. 
said the blade to the axe, and shall none say him nay, never a broadsword to bar him the way, never a bush where a huron may hide, nor the shot of a shawnee spit red on his side, down the long trail from the fort to the ford, naked and streaked, plunge a moccasined horde, huron and wyadot hot for the bout, shawnee and ottawa barring him out. Reddening the ridge twixt a gourd in a gorge, bold to the sky loom the ranks of St. George, Braddock of Fontenoy, belted and horsed, for a foe to be struck and a pass to be forced, twixt the pit and the crest, twixt the rocks and the grass, where the bush hides the foe and the foe holds the pass, Beaujou and Pontiac striving amain, Huron and Wyadot jeering the slain. Beaujou, bon comrade, Beaujou the gay, Beaujou and death cast their blades in the fray, never a rifle that spared when they spoke, never a scalf knight that balked in its stroke till the red hillocks marked where the standards had danced, and the grenadiers gasped where their sabres had glanced. But Braddock raged fierce in that storm by the ford, and railed at his curs with the flat of his sword. Said the sword to the axe, Where's your berserker now? Lo, his bones mark a path for a countryman's cow. And Beaujau the gay, give him place, right or wrong, in your tale of a camp, of your stave of a song. But Braddock of Fontenoy, stubborn and grim, who but he carved a cross on the wilderness rim, in his own doom building large for the Lord, steeple and state, said the axe to the sword. John Williamson Palmer End of section 36section 37 of poems of american history the colonial era this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by joseph tabler poems of american history the colonial era chapter 8 the struggle for the continent part 6 after Braddock's defeat, the Pennsylvania and Virginia frontiers were left for a time to the ravages of the Indians. The colonies were slow to defend themselves, and could get no aid whatever from England, who had her hands full elsewhere. Ode to the Inhabitants of Pennsylvania, September 30, 1756. Published in the Pennsylvania Gazette, September 30, 1756. Ode to the Inhabitants of Pennsylvania. Still shall the tyrant scourge of Gaul with wasteful rage resistless fall on Britain's slumbering race? Still shall she wave her bloody hand and threatening banners o'er this land to Britain's fell disgrace? And not one generous chieftain rise who dares the frown of war despise and treacherous fear disclaim his country's ruin to oppose to hurl destruction on her foes and blast their rising fame in britain's cause with valor fired braddock unhappy chief expired and claimed a nation's tear nor could oswego's bulwark stand the fury of a savage band though schuyler's arm was there still shall this motley murderous crew their deep destructive arts pursue and general horror spread no see britannia's genius rise swift o'er the atlantic foam she flies and lifts her laurelled head lo streaming through the dear blue sky great luden's awful banners fly in british pomp displayed soon shall the gallant chief advance before him shrink the sons of france confounded and dismayed then rise illustrious britons rise great freedom calls pursue her voice and save your country's shame let every hand for britain armed and every breast with virtue warmed aspire at deathless fame but chief let pennsylvania wake and on her foes let terror shake their gloomy troops defy for lo her smoking farms and plains her captured youths and murdered swains for vengeance louder cry why should we seek inglorious rest or sink with thoughtless ease oppressed while war insults so near while ruthless fierce a thirst for blood bologna's sons a desperate brood and furious bands appear rouse 
rouse at once and boldly chase from their deep haunts the savage race till they confess you men let other armstrongs grace the field let other slaves before them yield and tremble round duquesne and thou our chief and martial guide of worth approved of valor tried in many a hard campaign o oh, denny warmed with british fire our inexperienced troops inspire and conquest's laurels gain pennsylvania gazette september thirty seventeen fifty six no author given meanwhile things were in a troubled condition in acadia where the so-called french neutrals were discovered to be in arms against england every resource of patience and persuasion had been used to secure their loyalty to great britain but in vain at last it was decided to disperse them among the southern provinces and the deportation began in october at the end of two months about six thousand of the acadians had been sent away and their homes destroyed the embarkation from evangeline by henry wadsworth longfellow october eighth seventeen fifty five the embarkation four times the sun had risen and set and now on the fifth day cheerily called the cock to the sleeping maids of the farmhouse soon o'er the yellow fields in silent and mournful procession came from the neighboring hamlets and farms the acadian women driving in ponderous wains their household goods to the seashore pausing and looking back to gaze once more on their dwellings ere they were shut from sight by the winding road and the woodland close at their sides their children ran and urged on the oxen while in their little hands they clasped some fragments of playthings thus to gasparo's mouth they hurried and there on the sea beach piled in confusion lay the household goods of the peasants all day long between the shore and the ships did the boats ply all day long the wains came laboring down from the village late in the afternoon when the sun was near to his setting echoed far o'er the fields came the roll of drums from the churchyard thither the women and children thronged on a sudden the church doors opened and forth came the guard and marching in gloomy procession followed the long imprisoned but patient acadian farmers even as pilgrims who journey afar from their homes and their country sing as they go and in singing forget they are weary and war-worn so with songs on their lips the acadian peasants descended down from the church to the shore amid their wives and their daughters foremost the young men came and raising together their voices sang with tremulous lips a chant of the catholic missions sacred heart of the saviour o inexhaustible fountain fill our hearts this day with strength and submission and patience then the old men as they marched and the women that stood by the wayside joined in the sacred psalm and the birds in the sunshine above them mingled their notes therewith like voices of spirits departed thus to the gasparo's mouth moved on that mournful procession their disorder prevailed and the tumult and stir of embarking busily plied the freighted boats and in the confusion wives were torn from their husbands and mothers too late saw their children left on the land extending their arms with wildest entreaties so unto separate ships were basil and gabriel carried while in despair on the shore evangeline stood with her father half the task was not done when the sun went down and the twilight deepened and darkened around and in haste the refluent ocean fled away from the shore and left the line of the sand beach covered with waifs of the tide with kelp and the slippery seaweed farther back in the midst of the household goods and the wagons like to a gypsy camp or a leaguer after a battle all escape cut off by the sea and the sentinels near them lay encamped for the night the houseless acadian farmers back to its nethermost caves retreated the bellowing ocean dragging adown the beach the rattling pebbles and leaving inland and far up the shore the stranded boats of the sailors then as the night descended the herds returned from their pastures sweet was the moist still air with the odor of milk from their udders 
lowing they waited and long at the well-known bars of the farmyard waited and looked in vain for the voice and the hand of the milkmaid silence reigned in the streets from the church no angelus sounded rose no smoke from the roofs and gleamed no lights from the windows suddenly rose from the south a light as in autumn the blood-red moon climbs the crystal walls of heaven and o'er the horizon titan-like stretches its hundred hands upon the mountain and the meadow seizing the rocks and the rivers and piling huge shadows together broader and ever broader it gleamed on the roofs of the village gleamed on the sky and sea and the ships that lay in the roadstead columns of shining smoke uprose and flashes of flame were thrust through their folds and withdrawn like the quivering hands of a martyr then as the wind seized the gleeds and the burning thatch and uplifting whirled them aloft through the air at once from a hundred housetops started the sheeted smoke with flashes of flame intermingled these things beheld in dismay the crowd on the shore and on shipboard speechless at first they stood then cried aloud in their anguish we shall behold no more our homes in the village of grand pre loud on a sudden the cocks began to crow in the farmyards thinking the day had dawned and anon the lowing of cattle came on the evening breeze by the barking of dogs interrupted then rose a sound of dread such as startles the sleeping encampments far in the western prairies or forests that skirt the nebraska when the wild horses affrighted sweep by with the speed of the whirlwind or the loud bellowing herds of buffaloes rush to the river such was the sound that arose on the night as the herds and the horses broke through their folds and fences and madly rushed o'er the meadows lo with a mournful sound like the voice of a vast congregation solemnly answered the sea and mingled its roar with the dirges twas the returning tide that afar from the waste of the ocean with the first dawn of the day came heaving and hurrying landward then recommenced once more the stir and noise of embarking and with the ebb of the tide the ships sailed out of the harbor leaving behind them the dead on the shore and the village in ruins henry wadsworth longfellow in july seventeen fifty eight an army of fifteen thousand under general james abercrombie and brigadier lord howe attempted to take ticonderoga where montcalm was stationed at the head of about three thousand men lord howe the very life of the army was killed in the first skirmish and abercrombie handled the army so badly that it was repulsed with a loss of nearly two thousand and fled in a panic the french loss was less than four hundred and the victory was hailed as one of the greatest ever achieved by french arms in america on the defeat at ticonderoga or carillong july eighth seventeen fifty eight london magazine no author neglected long had been my useless lyre and heartfelt grief repressed the poet's fire but roused by dire alarms of wasting war again o muse the solemn dirge prepare and join the widow's orphan's parents tear unwept unsung shall britain's chiefs remain doomed in this stranger clime to bleed in vain here a last refuge hapless braddock found when the grim savage gave the deadly wound ah hide monongahel thy hateful head still as thy waves roll near the injured dead on whose gore moistened banks the numerous slain now spring in vegetative life again whilst their wan ghosts as night's dark gloom prevail murmur to whistling winds the mournful tale cease cease ye grisly forms nor wail the past lo a new scene of death exceeds the last the empurpled fields of carolong survey rich with the spoils of one disastrous day bold to the charge the ready veterans stood and thrice repelled as oft the fight renewed till 
life's warm current drained they sunk in blood unchecked their ardor unallayed their fire see beaver proby rutherford expire silent britannia's tardy thunder lay while clouds of gallic smoke obscured the day the intrepid race nursed on the mountain's brow or leap the mound and dare the astonished foe whilst albion's sons mowed down in ranks bemoan their much-loved country's wrongs nor feel their own cheerless they hear the drum discordant beat and with slow motion sullenly retreat but where wert thou o oh, first in martial fame whose early cares distinguished praises claim who every welcome toil didst gladly share and taught the enervate warrior want to bear illustrious how whose every deed confessed the patriot wish that filled thy generous breast alas too swift to explore the hostile land thou didst sad victim to an ambush band nor ere this hour of wild confusion viewed like braddock falling in the pathless wood still near the spot where thy pale course is laid may the fresh laurel spread its amplest shade still may thy name be uttered with a sigh and the big drops swell every grateful eye oh would each leader who deplores thy fate thy zeal and active virtues emulate soon should proud carolong be humbled low nor montcalm's self prevent the avenging blow london magazine 1759 but at last the tide turned in 1757 william pitt forced his way to the leadership of the government in england and at once formed a comprehensive plan for a combined attack on the french forts in america the first point of attack was louisburg which had been ceded back to france in 1748 and in the spring of 1758 a strong expedition under lord amherst was dispatched against it the siege commenced june eight the very day of the disaster at ticonderoga and after a tremendous bombardment which destroyed the town and badly breached the fortress the garrison numbering nearly six thousand surrendered july twenty sixth seventeen fifty eight on the late successful expedition against lewisburg july twenty sixth seventeen fifty eight by francis hopkinson at length tis done the glorious conflicts done and british valor hath the conquest won success our arms our heroes honor crowns and lewisburg an english monarch owns swift to the scene where late the valiant fought waft me ye muses on the wings of thought that awful scene where the dread god of war or field of death rolled his triumphant car there yet with fancy's eye methinks i view the pressing throng the fierce assault renew with dauntless front advance and boldly brave the cannon's thunder and the expecting grave on yonder cliff high hanging o'er the deep where trembling joy climbs the darksome steep britannia lonely sitting from afar waits the event and overlooks the war thence rolls her eager eyes wandering eyes about in all the dread anxiety of doubt sees her fierce sons her foes with vengeance smite grasp deathless honors and maintain the fight whilst thus her breast alternate passions sway and hope and fear wear the slow hours away see from the realms of everlasting light a radiant form wings her aerial flight the palm she carries and the crown she wears plainly denote tis victory appears her crimson vestment loosely flows behind the clouds her chariot and the wings her wind trumpets shrill sounding all around her play and laurelled honours gild her azure way now she alights the trumpets cease to sound her presence spreads expecting silence round and thus she speaks whilst from her heavenly face effulgent glories brighten all the place britannia hail thine is at length the day and lasting triumphs shall thy cares repay thy godlike sons by this 
their names shall raise and tongues remote shall joy to swell their praise i to the listening world shall soon proclaim of wolf's brave deeds the never-dying fame and swell with glory amherst's patriot name such are the heroes that shall ever bring wealth to their country honor to their king opposing foes in vain attempt to quell the native fires that in such bosoms dwell to thee with joy this laurel i resign smile smile britannia victory is thine long may it flourish on thy sacred brow long may thy foes a forced subjection know see see their power their boasted power decline rejoice britannia victory is thine give your loose canvas to the breezes free ye floating thunders bulwarks of the sea go bear the joyful tidings to your king and in the voice of war declare tis victory you bring let the wild crowd that catch the breath of fame in mad huzzas their ruder joy proclaim let their loud thanks to heaven in flames ascend while mingling shouts the azure concave rend but let the few whom reason makes more wise with glowing gratitude uplift their eyes oh let their breasts dilate with sober joy let pious praise their hearts and tongues employ to bless our god with me let all unite he guides the conquering sword he governs the fight francis hopkinson End of section 37section thirty eight of poems of american history the colonial era this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recorded by greg giordano newport ritchie florida poems of american history the colonial era chapter eight the struggle for the continent part six the fall of lewisburg was followed a few months later by the capture of fort duquesne november twenty five seventeen fifty eight by general john forbes forbes at the head of an excellent army had proceeded slowly and carefully as the english approached the french realized that to remain was simply to be captured so they deserted the hopeless post and forbes marched in unmolested he named his conquest fort pitt after the great minister fort duquesne a historical centennial ballad november twenty five seventeen fifty eight to eighteen fifty eight come fill the beaker while we chant a pean of old days by mars no men shall live again more worthy of our praise than they who stormed at lewisburg and frontenac amain and shook the english standard out o'er the ruins of duquesne for glorious were the days they came the soldiers strong and true and glorious were the days they came for pennsylvania too when marched the troopers sternly on through forests autumn brown and where st george's cross was raised the oriflame went down virginia sent her chivalry and maryland her brave and pennsylvania to the cause her noblest yeomen gave oh and proud were they who wore the garb of indian hunters then for every sturdy youth was worth a score of common men they came from carolina's pines from fruitful delaware the staunchest and the stoutest of the chivalrous were there and calm and tall above them all erode the november sun like saul above his brethren rode colonel washington o'er leagues of wild and waste they passed they forded stream and fen where danger lurked in every glade and death in every glen 
They heard the Indian ranger's cry, the Frenchman's far-off hail. From purple distance echoed back through the hollows of the vale. And ever and anon they came along their dangerous way, where ghastly mid the yellow leaves their slaughtered comrades lay. The tartans of Grant's Highlanders were sodden yet in red, as routed in the rash assault they perished as they fled. Ah, many a lass ayant the tweed shall rue the fatal fray, and high Virginian dame shall mourn the ruin of that day. When gallant lad and cavalier in the wilderness were slain, twixt laureled loyal Hanna and the outposts of Duquesne. And there before them was the field of massacre and blood, of panic, rout, and shameful flight in that disastrous wood, where Halkett fell and Braddock died with many a noble one, whose white bones glistened through the leaves in the pale November sun. Then spoke the men of Braddock's field, and hung their heads in shame, for England's tarnished honor, and for England's sullied fame. And, by St. George, the soldiers swore, will wipe away the stain, before to-morrow's sunset, at the trenches of Duquesne. T'was night along the autumn hills, the sun's November gleam, had left its crimson on the leaves, its tinge upon the stream, and hermit silence kept his watch bid ancient rocks and trees, and placed his finger on the lip of babbling brook and breeze. The bivouac set by Turtle Creek, and while the soldiers sleep, the swarthy chiefs around the fires an anxious council keep. Some spoke of murmurs in the camp, scarce whispered to the air, but tokens of discouragement the presage of despair some a retreat advised twas late the winter drawing on the forage and provision too so ormsby said were gone men could not feed on air and fight whatever pitt might say in praise or censure still they thought twere wiser to delay then up spoke iron-headed forbes and through his feeble frame there ran the lightning of a will that put them all to shame. I'll hear no more, he roundly swore, we'll storm the fort amain. I'll sleep in hell to-morrow night, or sleep in Fort Duquesne. So said, and each to sleep addressed his wearied limbs and mind, and all was hushed in the forest save the sobbing of the wind. And the tramp, tramp, tramp of the sentinel who started oft in fright, at the shadows wrought mid the giant trees, by the fitful camp-fire light. Good Lord, what sudden glare is that, that reddens all the sky, as though hell's legions rode the air, and tossed their torches high. Up, men, the alarm drum beats to arms, and the solid ground seems riven, by the shock of warring thunderbolts, in the lurid depth of heaven. Oh, there was clattering of steel, and mustering in array, and shouts and wild huzzas of men, impatient of delay. As came the scouts with footed in, they fly, the foe they fly, they fired the powder magazine, and blown it to the sky. Now morning over the frosty hills, in autumn splendor came, and touched the rolling mists with gold, and flecked the clouds with flame. And through the brown woods on the hills, those altars of the world, the blue smoke from the settler's hut, and Indians wigwam curled. Yet never here had morning dawned on such a glorious din, of twanging trump and rattling drum and clanging culverin, and glittering arms and sabre gleams and serried ranks of men who marched with banners high advanced along the river glen. Oh, and royally they bore themselves, who knew that o'er the seas would speed the glorious tidings from the loyal colonies of the fall of French dominion with the fall of Fort Duquesne, 
and the triumph of the English arms from Erie to Champlain. Before high noon they halted, and while they stood at rest, they saw unfolded gloriously the gateway of the West. There flashed the Allegheny like a scimitar of gold, and king-like in its majesty Monongahela rolled. Beyond the river beautiful swept down the woody vales, where commerce ere a century passed should spread her thousand sails. Between the hazy hills they saw Contracurs armed bateau, and the flying flashing feathery oars of the Ottawa's canoes. Then on from rank to rank of men a shout of triumph ran, and while the cannon thundered, the leader of the van, the tall Virginian mounted on the walls that smoldered yet, and shook the English standard out, and named the place Fort Pitt. Again with wild huzzas the hills and river valleys ring, and they swing their loyal caps in air, and shout, Long live the king! Long life unto King George, they cry, and glorious be the reign that adds to English statesmen pit, to English arms Duquesne. Florius B. Plimpton Pitt determined to strike a blow at the very center of French power, and on June 26, 1759, an English fleet of twenty-two ships of the line, with frigates, sloops of war, and transports carrying nine thousand regulars, appeared before Quebec. In command of this great expedition was Major General James Wolfe, who had played so dashing a part in the capture of Louisburg the year before, and was soon to win immortal glory. Hot Stuff, June 1759 Come, each death-doing dog who dares venture his neck, Come, follow the hero that goes to Quebec, Jump aboard of the transports, and loose every sail. Pay your debts at the tavern by giving leg bail. And ye that love fighting shall soon have enough. Wolf commands us, my boys, we shall give them hot stuff. Up the river St. Lawrence our troops shall advance. To the grenadiers' march we will teach them to dance. Cape Breton we have taken, and next we will try at their capital to give them another black eye. Baudrell, tis in vain you pretend to look gruff. Those are coming who know how to give you hot stuff. With powder in his periwig and snuff in his nose, Monsieur will run down our descent to oppose. And the Indians will come, but the light infantry will soon oblige them to betake to a tree. From such rascals, as they may, we fear a rebuff. Advance, grenadiers, and let fly your hot stuff. When the 47th Regiment is dashing ashore, While bullets are whistling and cannon do roar, Says Montcalma, those are Shirley's, I know the lapels. You lie, says Ned Botwood, we belong to Lascelles. Though our clothing is changed, Yet we scorn a powder puff. So at ye, ye bitches, here's give you hot stuff. Edward Botwood About the end of August, a place was found where the heights might be scaled, and an assault was ordered for the night of Wednesday, September 12. The night arrived. Every preparation had been made, and every order given. It only remained to wait the turning of the tide. Wolf was on board the flagship Sutherland, and to while away the hours of waiting, he is said to have written the little song, How Stands the Glass Around. How Stands the Glass Around, September 12, 1759. How stands the glass around? For shame, you take no care, my boys. How stands the glass around? Let mirth and wine abound. The trumpets sound, the colors they are flying, boys, to fight, kill, or wound. May we still be found, content with our hard fate, my boys, on the cold ground. Why, soldiers, why, 
Should we be melancholy, boys? Why, soldiers, why? Whose business tis to die? What? Sighing, fie? Don't fear, drink on, be jolly, boys. Tis he, you, or I. Cold, hot, wet, or dry. We're always bound to follow, boys, and scorn to fly. Tis but in vain, I mean not to abrade you, boys. Tis but in vain for soldiers to complain. Should next campaign send us to him who made us, boys, we're free from pain. But if we remain, a bottle and a kind landlady cure all again. James Wolfe End of Section 38「Section 39 of Poems of American History, The Colonial Era. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Poems of American History, The Colonial Era, Chapter 8, The Struggle for the Continent, Part 8. Montcalm, riding out from Quebec early in the morning of Thursday, September 13, 1759, found the English drawn up in line of battle on the Plains of Abraham. They had scaled the cliffs in safety. He attacked about ten o'clock, but his troops were repulsed at the second volley, and fled in confusion back to the fort. Wolfe was killed in the charge which followed, and Montcalm was fatally wounded and died that night. The French were demoralized. A council was called, and the incredible resolution reached to abandon the fort without further resistance. The retreat commenced at once and Quebec was left to its fate. It was never again to pass into the hands of France. Brave Wolf, September 13, 1759 Cheer up, my young men all, let nothing fright you. Though oft objections rise, let it delight you. Let not your fancy move, whenever it comes to trial, nor let your courage fail at the first denial i sat down by my love thinking that i wooed her i sat down by my love but sure not to delude her but when i got to speak my tongue it doth so quiver i dare not speak my mind whenever i am with her love here's a ring of gold tis long that i have kept it my dear now for my sake, I pray you to accept it. When you the posy read, pray think upon the giver. My dear, remember me, or I'm undone forever. Then Wolf he took his leave of his most lovely jewel, although it seemed to be to him an act most cruel. Although it's for a space, I'm forced to leave my love. My dear, wherever I rove, I'll never forget my dove. So then this valiant youth embarked on the ocean to free America from faction's dire commotion. He landed at Quebec, being all brave and hardy, the city to attack with his most gallant party. Then Wolf drew up his men in rank and file so pretty on Abraham's lofty heights, before this noble city. A distance from the town, the noble French did meet them, in double numbers there, resolved for to beat them. A parley, Wolf and Montcalm together. Montcalm and this brave youth, together they are walking, so well they do agree like brothers they are talking then each one to his post 
as they do now retire. Oh, then their numerous hosts began their dreadful fire. Then instant from his horse fell this most noble hero. May we lament his loss in words of deepest sorrow. The French are seen to break, their columns all are flying. Then Wolf he seems to wake, though in the act of dying. And lifting up his head, the drums and trumpets rattle. And to his army said, I pray, how goes the battle? His aide-de-camp replied, Brave general, tis in our favor. Quebec in all her pride, tis nothing now can save her. She falls into our hands, with all her wealth and treasure. Oh, then, brave wolf replied, I quit the world with pleasure. Wolf's death almost overshadowed the victory. Major Knox, in his diary, writes, Our joy at this success is inexpressibly damped by the loss we sustained of one of the greatest heroes which this or any other age can boast of. THE DEATH OF WOLF, SEPTEMBER 13, 1759 Thy merits, Wolf, transcend all human praise. The breathing marble or the muses lays. Art is but vain, the force of language weak, To paint thy virtues, or thy actions speak. Had I Duchess or Godfrey's magic skill, Each line to raise, and animate at will, To rouse each passion dormant in the soul, Point out its object, or its rage control. Then woof, some faint resemblance should we find, Of those great virtues that adorn thy mind. Like Britain's genius shouldst thou then appear, Hurling destruction on the Gaelic rear, While France, astonished, trembled at thy sight, and placed her safety in ignoble flight. The last great scene should melt each Briton's heart, and rage and grief alternately impart, with foes surrounded midst the shades of death. These were the words that closed the warrior's breath. My eyesight fails, but does the foe retreat? If they retire, I'm happy in my fate. A generous chief, to whom the hero spoke, Cried, Sir, they fly, their ranks entirely broke. Wilt thy bold troops o'er slaughtered heaps advance, And deal due vengeance on the sons of France? The pleasing truth recalls his parting soul, And from his lips these dying accents stole. I'm satisfied, he said, then winged his way, Guarded by angels to celestial day. An awful band, Britannia's mighty dead, Receives to glory his immortal shade. Marlborough and Talbot hail the warlike chief, Halkett and Howe laid objects of our grief, With joyful song conduct their welcome guest To the bright mansions of eternal rest. For those prepared who merit just applause By bravely dying in their country's cause. Pennsylvania Gazette, November 8, 1759 End of Section 39、Section、40 of Poems of American History, The Colonial Era This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Eileen Tipping Poems of American History, The Colonial Era Chapter 8 The Struggle for the Continent Part 9 The fall of Quebec settled the fate of Canada, on September 8, 1760, Vaudrill surrendered Montreal to a great besieging force under Amherst. 
by the terms of the capitulation, Canada and all its dependencies passed to the British crown. The fight for the continent was ended. Indian hostilities continued for some years, and it was not until October 1764 that peace was made with them. One of its conditions was the return of all captives taken by the Indians, and they were assembled at Carlisle, Pennsylvania, December 31, 1764. It was there the incident took place, which is related in the following verses. The Captive's Hymn Carlisle, Pennsylvania, December 31, 1764 the Indian War was over, and Pennsylvania's towns welcomed the blessed calm that comes when peace a conflict crowns. Bitter and long had been the strife, but gallant Colonel Bouquet had forced the foe to sue for grace, and named the joyful day when Shawnees, Tuscarawas, Miamis, Delawares, and every band that roved the land and called a captive theirs, from the pathless depths of the forest by stream and dark defile, should bring their prisoners on their lives in safety to Carlisle. Carlisle, in the Cumberland Valley, where Connodogwinet flows, and the guardian ranges north and south in mountain pride repose. Like the wind the colonel's order to hamlet and clearing flew, and mourning mothers and wives and sons from banks where delaware seaward runs from erie's wave and ohio's tide and the vales where the southern hills divide flocked to the town perchance to view at last mid the crowds by the startled square the faces lost but in memory fair how strange the scene on the village green that morning cold and gray to right the Indian tents were set, and in groups the dusky warriors met, while their captives clung to the captors yet, as wild and bronzed as they, in rags and skins with moccasined feet, some loath to part, some fain to greet the friends of a vanished day. And eagerly watching the tents to left stood mothers and sons and wives bereft, while beyond were the throngs from hill and valley, and waiting the keen-eyed colonel's rally, the troops in their brave array. Now friends and captives mingle, and cries of joy or woe thrill the broad street as loved ones meet, or in vain the tale of the past repeat, and back in anguish go. Among them lingered a widow. From the Swabian land was she, and one fell morning she had lost husband and children three all slain save the young regina a captive spared to be nine weary years had followed but the wilderness was dumb and never a word to her aching heart through friend or foe had come and now from tulpahocken full seventy miles away she had walked to seek her daughter the lord her only stay. She scanned the sun-browned maidens, but the tunic's rough disguise, the savage tongue, the forest ways, baffled and mocked her yearning gaze, and with sobs and streaming eyes she turned to the colonel and told him how hopeless was her quest. Moaning, Alas, Regina, the grave for me is best. Nay, madam, gently he replied, Don't be disheartened yet, but bide, And try some other test. What pleasant song or story Did she love from your lips to hear? O oh, sir, I taught her our father And the creed we hold so dear. And she said them over and over While I was spinning near. And every eve by her little bed, When the light was growing dim, I sung her to sleep, my darling, with Schmolke's beautiful hymn. Then sing it now, said the colonel, and close to the captive band he brought the mother with her hymn from the far Swabian land, and with faltering voice and quivering lips, while all was hushed, she sung the strain of lofty faith and cheer 
in her rich German tongue. Allein und doch nicht ganz allein, how near the listeners press. Alone, yet not alone am I, though all may deem my days go by in utter dreariness. The Lord is still my company, I am with him, and he with me, the solitude to bless. He speaks to me within his word as if his very voice I heard, and when I pray apart, he meets me in the quiet there, with counsel for each cross and care, and comfort for my heart. The world may say my life is lone, with every joy and blessing flown, its vision can descry. I shall not sorrow nor repine, for glorious company is mine, with God and angels nigh. As she sung, a maid of the captives threw back her tangled hair, and forward leaned, as if to list the lightest murmur there. Her breath came fast, her brown cheek flushed, her eyes grew bright and wide, as if some spell the song had cast, and ere the low notes died, with a bound like a deer in the forest, she sprang to the singer's side, and, Liebe kleine Mutter, and folding her she cried, My dear, dear little mother. Then swift before her knelt, as in the long, long buried days, when by the wood they dwelt, and Vater unser, der du bist im Himmel, chanted she, the sweet our father she had learned beside her mother's knee, and then the grand apostle's creed that in her heart had lain, ich glaube an Gott der Vater, like a child she said again, I believe in God the Father, down to the blessed Amen. Stooping and clasping the maiden whose soul the song had freed, Now God be praised, said the mother, This is my child indeed, My own, my darling Regina, Come back in my sorest need, For she knows the hymn, And our father, And the holy apostles' creed. Then while the throng was silent, And the colonel bowed his head, With tears and glad thanksgivings, Her daughter forth she led. And the sky was lit with sunshine, and the cold earth caught its smile, for the mother and ransomed maiden, that morning in Carlisle. Edna Dean Proctor A Prophecy, 1764 Ere five score years have run their tedious rounds, if yet oppression breaks o'er human bounds, as it has done the last sad passing year, may the new world in anger shed a tear, unmindful of her native once loved isle. They'll bid allegiance cease her peaceful smile, while from their arms they tear oppression's chain, and make lost liberty once more to reign. But let them live as they would choose to be, loyal to king and as true Britons free. They'll ne'er by fell revolt oppose that crown, which first has raised them, though now pulls them down. If but the rights of subjects they receive, tis all they ask, or all a crown can give. Arthur Lee End of Section 40 End of Poems of American History, The Colonial Era, 1775-1880